Hello. Hello and welcome to the Yale University Art Gallery. Thank you for joining for those of you here and for those of you online. It is wonderful to see so many people here today. My name is Jessica Sack. I'm the Jan and Frederick Mayor Curator of Public, sorry, I'm the Jan and Frederick Mayor Curator of Public Education and I'm very pleased to welcome you to this four-part lecture series by John Walsh, Looking at Mondrian. Today's lecture will focus on Mondrian in Paris. John Walsh is an art historian, curator, museum director, and teacher based in Los Angeles. He graduated from Yale College in 1961 and earned his PhD from Columbia University. John is a long-serving member of the governing board at the gallery, and I'm especially honored to be introducing John as today as John and I work closely together. For the past 17 years, he has joined me each fall to help train the Wordle Gallery teachers. These are graduate students trained as museum educators who teach the K-12 groups in the museum. The training focuses on the skills of teaching in front of works of art and learning to look, and students refer to him as our art history coach. <laughs> the technique and close looking that you will experience today are samplings <coughs> of what John has shared with the gallery teachers. Our teaching method is based on close looking and slowing down, and it's inspired by John's training. John is an amazing mentor. His commitment to close looking and to the nurturing of aspiring scholars is a benefit to us all. For those of you joining us online, please note that high resolution images from our collection are available on the new website. And so are John's more than 45 public lectures given here at the gallery. Highlights include the Rembrandt, the series Rembrandt Today and Vincent van Gogh's Turning Points. This series is generously sponsored by the Martin A. Ryerson Lectureship Fund and the John Walsh Lecture and Education Fund. And we are grateful for all of you joining us in the lecture hall and online. And we are grateful to you, John, for helping us learn to look, sorry, for helping us learn through looking. Please join me in welcoming the one and only John Walsh. Jessica, thank you. I wouldn't still be here. <laughs> <laughs> without you, believe it. Well, in the first lecture, we looked at Mondrian's beginnings in Holland as a talented landscape painter. He'd had a solid academic training, and then he played it safe, very much to the taste of the conservative 19th century art market in Amsterdam. His subjects were usually local scenes, and he had to do lesser jobs like portraits and still lifes to make a living, but barely. His oil sketches of landscapes are brushy and fresh and confident. He pedaled out into the polders uh, around Amsterdam to paint, uh, and in his early 30s, he was composing scenes along the rivers that often had a severe frontal composition and a sometimes a mysterious atmosphere. Along with other Dutch writers and artists, uh, Mondrian had been studying the esoteric teachings of theosophy, a blend of Neoplatonism, Stoicism, Buddhism, and Christianity, which strengthened his purpose as an artist, which was to make art that would represent the elemental in nature, not just its appearances. And he tried out some radically simple compositions, pushing color contrasts and using loose brushwork. He was living in a new studio in Amsterdam and getting respectful attention from some critics and other artists. A visit to Zeeland on the coast led to more summer trips and more daring experiments with unfamiliar, isolated motifs and colors and light. Cubism came to Amsterdam in exhibitions and Mondrian responded with experiments in black and gray, putting thick brush strokes between the branches as well as the sky and the ground, reducing any illusion of space. He went to Paris to see for himself, and he spent two and a half years among the avant-garde there. His style evolved toward his own kind of cubism based on tree forms and building facades. He wrote 
later on, more and more I excluded from my painting all curved lines until finally my compositions consisted only of vertical and horizontal lines which formed crosses, each one separate and detached from the other. Observing sea and sky and stars, I sought to indicate their form-giving function through a multiplicity of cross crossing verticals and horizontals. But well, we had reached this point uh, in the first lecture. Uh, in 1914, spending a couple of formative years in Paris, he, after that he returned to Holland to see his family. But when the war broke out, Mondrian got stuck there and he couldn't get back to Paris for more than five years, until 1919. In Holland, he boarded with families and worked in relative solitude in various borrowed studios in the town of Laren, 25 miles east of Amsterdam, and he went down to Zeeland in the summers and worked there. Laren was a civilized exurb with amenities like this little inn where he went to dance and dine regularly. He was no recluse. In fact, there were plenty of educated people around philosophers, composers, painters, writers, some of whom sharpened his own ideas about his work. In 1915, he met a young critic and painter, Theo von Duisburg, who had seen in, in, <coughs> in an exhibition one of several of Mondrian's radical compositions of the sea and pier, and he wrote in his review that it, and I'm quoting him, stirred in him associations of pure spirituality. The impression, he said, is one of calm, the stillness of the soul. Well, that's just what Mondrian was after. The year before, uh, Mondrian had written this to a friendly critic uh, called Hank Bremer. Nature, or that which I see, inspires me, <coughs> provides me, as it does every painter, with the emotion by which I am moved to create something. Mondrian believed that his job as a modern painter was not to picture things in nature, but to make abstract images that embodied his response to them. The more paintings resemble things in the world, he dad, the less they can convey of their essential nature and his emotional experience of them. Hank Bremer had said in a lecture in Amsterdam that this picture by Mondrian lived and breathed the clear, pure atmosphere of Christmas Eve. <laughs> They had the same reaction. Afterward, people, <laughs> people said <laughs> that Bremer was really off the mark. Was he really seeing a picture of pine trees in the snow? But Mondrian charitably wrote Bremer to support him. He said it didn't really matter what it portrayed in the usual sense of representation. And you were quite right in saying that my picture had a Christmas Eve atmosphere. If you portray the idea of Christmas in a truly abstract way, then you're expressing stillness, equilibrium, the domination of the spiritual, etc. And that is undoubtedly what you intended to say. <laughs> uh, Mondrian wrote that uh, tactful and generous line at the beginning of three years of experiment as an artist and a writer. His output of paintings uh, was actually pretty meager. Uh, instead, he struggled to explain in print what his art was meant to do. He was encouraged by Duisper, who was younger and energetic and far more worldly and professionally on the make. They exchanged many letters and occasionally they got together in Laren. Uh, Duisper was not a great painter, but he got a lot more serious under Mondrian's influence and was a talented organizer and publicist. This man, uh, Bart van der Leck, on the right, was also important for Mondrian's art at this stage. They'd been friends before Mondrian's stay in Paris, and they saw things with a spiritual bent and a leftward political inclination. They exchanged ideas. 
Van der Lecke was making poster-like paintings with big flat forms, hard outlines, primary colors. Those colors evidently suggested themselves to Mondrian, and soon he was using them, as we're going to see in a minute. Mondrian had been using black lines and bars, which you've also been seeing, and those suggested to von der Lecke a way of further abstracting his outline drawings into line fragments, which is what you see in the middle. This composition marks a turning point for Mondrian. The changes that he made to it between 1916 and 17 concentrated its energy and gave it more variety. At the right, he squares the ends of each of those black bars, removing potential confusion with Christmas trees, goalposts, and ship's masts, or whatever other familiar things might tempt us to see. He's not just at the edge of the unrecognizable. He's developing a rationale for stepping over that edge into the fully abstract, into the abs absolute. For Mondrian, the absolute in art is embodied in the play of opposing forces, the balance between them. He's testing the possibilities for shapes and colors and lines to be those opposing forces. After years of seeking a spiritual purpose for his paintings, he's found it. It's to bring about awakening in us viewers, elevating and cleansing without words, the way music does. It's to help us shed our stale habits of thought and see freshly and more deeply. Mondrian thought that if people did evolve in that way, it would somehow trickle up and would help the nations ref reform themselves in time, become less selfish and less bloody-minded. Mondrian took on the role of theoretician. A little group around Laren grew to include three uh, painters, a couple of architects, a sculptor, a composer, and a poet. And we know from their letters to one another that the painters debated possibilities uh, for theory. Just how severe should the geometry be? Horizontal and virtual, uh, <coughs> horizontal and virtual and uh, vertical lines only? Really? No curves, no diagonals? What about colors? The three primaries only? Or mixed? Saturated or muted? Uh, one outcome was to an agreement to get these ideas into print. The project would have a voice, a multilingual monthly called De Stael, that began in 1917, three years into World War I. And like most art movements at the time, it published a manifesto. This one aimed at rousing artists of the world, including painters, sculptors, architects, to join the struggle against selfishness, against despotism. Well, with a little editing, I've extracted six key points. One, there is an old and a new consciousness of time. The old is connected with the individual. The new is connected with the universal. The struggle of the individual against the universal is revealing itself in the world war, as well as in the art of the present day. Two, the war is destroying the old world with its contents, individual do domination in every state. The new art has brought forward what the new consciousness of time contains, a balance between the universal and the individual. The new consciousness is prepared to realize the internal life as well as the external life. Traditions, dogmas, and the domination of the individual are opposed to this realization. The artists of today have been driven the whole world over by the same consciousness and therefore have taken a part uh, from an intellectual point of view in this war against the domination of individual despotism. We therefore sympathize with all who work for the formation of an international unity in life, culture, either intellectually or materially. 
well. This is fervent and <laughs> vague and general enough where art is concerned to allow a lot of different beliefs to coexist. The combative tone, of the words like abolition and annihilation, uh, may sound a touch comical coming from pacifist painters in, in the neutral Netherlands, but um, that is the macho rhetoric of manifestos at the time. The movement was launched, it gained a following in the 1920s, and it put some respectable theory under the accelerating practices of abstract art. Architecture, too. I'll have some more to say about that in the last lecture. Well, in Mondrian, in uh, Laren, um, Mondrian's mm -hmm. struggles with his painting had competition with struggles um, to put his thoughts uh, about art uh, into words. His letters to friends had sharpened his mind and kept it flexible, but to write for publication on the future of art in society was harder, and it shows. He was sometimes vague or cryptic, especially where the spiritual was concerned. His first essay, called Neoplasticism in Painting, came out in installments of Destale in 1917 and 1918, and I don't worry about that terrible title, Neoplasticism, I'll come back to it later. Um, it promotes painting as a new, purer kind of art, superior to all the other visual arts and a model for them. Music was limited by duration and sound, architecture by practical functions, literature by words, which are ironically too specific. In Laren, he shared an attic for a while with his then companion, Micah Middlecope, and her fiance, the, the composer, uh, Jakob van Domselaar. Uh, just how that arrangement worked hasn't been made clear. <laughs> he and Domsalar debated whether and how abstract art could be a model for music or vice versa. Domsalar was an admirer of Arnold Schoenberg and composed minimalist pieces that confirmed for Mondrian that the validity of his own principle for art that it could be based on vertical and horizontal elements. You may hear some similarity as you listen to a minute or so of a suite of short pieces called Examples of Style, played by their mutual friend Nelly von Duschberg, uh, a Dada poet and pianist. <laughs> After he returned to Paris in 1919, Mondrian followed developments in contemporary music and dance, and music and dance for him being inseparable. All through the 1920s, wherever that led, including to some strange innovations, uh, for a, a time Mondrian was taken with the ideas of an Italian futurist painter called Luigi Russolo, who had written a treatise called The Art of Noises in 1916 about his invention of instruments he called intono rumori, literally noise generators. They formed a mini orchestra of musical instruments that produced all kinds of noises that the players could vary in pitch and volume using a lever, which the composer there in the middle is demonstrating. The program offered the following, these are the titles for the individual short pieces, screeching, creaking, rustling, buzzing, crackling, scraping. I'm going to play you a piece called Gorgoglietore, 
gurgler. <laughs> Rousseau abolished the old-fashioned personal musical stuff that belonged to the past, like virtuosity and beauty, <laughs> and declared that these manufactured noises would be the proper music of the future. Mondrian wrote that musical art today is seeking the amalgamation of the most dissonant, strange, and strident sounds. We are moving towards sound noise, for Rousseau's first performance in Paris in 1921, which caused furor in the audience, Mondrian was there. His biographer wrote that he, he was probably in the back row. Um, the music that Mondrian actually loved uh, was not avant-garde compositions uh, in the concert hall, but instead it was this. It was American jazz, boogie-woogie, which he could hear on records and live. This is Albert Ammons playing. Stomp, 1939, and Mondrian had the record. When he returned to Paris after the armistice in 1919, he discovered that there were discharged American soldiers playing jazz in the cafes. And Mondrian had taken dancing lessons in Holland, uh, though dancing in public, by the way, was actually against the law until 1924. So he knew the basics, and he was ready to pick up the two-step and the foxtrot and the shimmy, and later on the Charleston. Several of these steps invited a lot of body contact between the dancers, unlike the waltzes of their parents' generation. According to friends, Mondrian was an enthusiastic dancer and good at it, some said. Here he's in his studio playing jazz records for a visitor, the American artist Gwen Lux. Here again is the product of Mondrian's studies in Laren for a purely abstract painting in just black and white. And um, here that painting is in my mock-up, which is based on a photograph of the installation that he called for in 1917 
uh, an exhibition of contemporary art in Amsterdam. And it's bracketed, as you can see, by two smaller paintings that reintroduced color in the form of rectangular color planes and floating on a white ground. They mostly keep separate, but um, here and there, some of them sort of park next to each other and form clusters. They mostly stay inside the frame, but at the top edges, several of the squares are cut off as though they went up and are in the act of disappearing like figures ascending uh, to heaven, like Durer's, uh, for example, uh, Christ in the well-known woodcut of the Ascension four centuries earlier. Up close, you can see that there is a lot of paint laid on with great care. He pulls the thicker white up to the edge of the color planes, and there's a lot of adjustments where the black bars uh, end. In this self-portrait, he is impeccably dressed and he seems wary, as though caught in the mischief of the painting behind him, which has only gray patches. He'd been working on a series of compositions with floating planes in lighter colors, similar but not equal size, not quite lined up, in fact, placed with care, but only seemingly at random. They disappear at three edges, but not at the fourth. Again, you've got to examine them up close to notice the painter's hand and brush at work, making a lot of small adjustments. The irregular edges keep reminding you that there's nothing mechanical about how this artist proceeds. It's intuitive. In the following year, Mondrian took another tack. Um, he enlarged the color planes and fenced them in with gray lines. The overall effect seems improvised, or better, syncopated, with some curious results, like the smaller rectangles that seem to huddle in the corners at the upper left and the lower right. The color planes have been floating in white areas until now. Here, they've gotten bigger, and they've, they've gained status. Now they have an identity of their own. Well, here we have the elements of Mondrian's mature works. Meanwhile, though, he was off in another direction. He's experimenting, oops, yeah, experimenting um, with square canvases on which he painted diagonal grids on top of upright grids, superimposing them, in other words, and, and then hanging them with one quarter and down. It's possible that the idea grew out of debates with Bart van der Leck and Theo van Duisburg about whether diagonals logically belong in the vocabulary of their new stripped-down language of form. Mondrian wrote to van Duisburg, a while ago, I started a thing entirely in diamonds, like this. You can see the sketch. I have to find out if it's possible. Intellectually, I'm inclined to say it is. Perpendicular and flat lines can be seen everywhere in nature. By using a diagonal line, I would be canceling that out. But I'm inclined to say that this cannot be combined with the perpendicular and flat ones, or with different kinds of slanted lines. Well, he's sort of <laughs> arguing with himself, uh, and he illustrated it, as you can see, in, in that letter, rotated to a 45 degree tilt. And out of this came four uh, paintings with uh, diagonal lines uh, to hang that way with one corner down. This was something novel for the time, an intriguing combination of challenges to traditional ideas of balance, but not in itself new. Now Mondrian would have known it from memorial tablets with inscriptions that hang high in Dutch Calvinist churches. That, by the way, is just a footnote, not a claim of, of influence. And Brock composed a still life in diamond format that Mondrian might just have seen. Well, this disagreement over diagonals turned out to be an issue of dogma for Mondrian. It precipitated a break in his close friendship with Duisburg. 
Here's a variation. He paints color planes over a grid that's oriented differently by 45 degrees, but you can see that grid through the design above it. These first diamond paintings were a bit of a detour from the main direction of Mondrian's development. We'll, we'll be back to them. And meanwhile, another application of the regular grid of rectangles, and a big leap, this grid of 16 by 16 identical units, differing only in color, not square, but oblong, little blocks separated by fine lines, very carefully painted. Mondrian's design in color results from his sort of clustering blocks of the same colors into groups of two and three and four, leaving a vestige of a central spine vertically of whites and grays. And now, uh, a, a really dramatic variant, the same format, a companion piece, we think, that he exhibited together uh, with the light-colored one. The paint is dark and glossy, and the edges reflect points of light. This was a surprising allusion to something that he'd seen in nature, and which, at this point, Mondrian, you remember, had renounced representing. His friend von Duisberg learned this in a letter that M Mondrian sent him. He said, I do agree with you that the, that the destruction of the natural and its reconstruction must be accomplished according to a spiritual image, but I believe that we should take a broad view here. What is natural doesn't have to be a representation of something. I'm now working on a thing that is a reconstruction of a starry sky from nature. Someone uh, who says he uses a theme from nature can be right, but also someone who says he uses nothing at all. These grids were evidently the last thing he did in Holland before he returned to Paris, a very different Paris in 1919. He resettled quickly in his old studio in Montparnasse, and he took another task, tack, uh, this time back to a picture of a year before that we saw a moment ago, to large forms separated by thicker lines that form a kind of armature or structure, not modular, but varying from one painting to the next. Here it's kind of a, a kind of playful board game with no obvious system where few of the edges line up and there aren't any straight through lines from side to side, uh, no grid of equal intervals. Here, the forms vary in proportion and size and in color and saturation. At the right, muted, and at the left, more emphatic. The lines between the color blocks are still thin, like mullions in a glass window. Here and there, the lines don't reach the edge of the picture, but stop short. Mondrian clarifies this formula on the right. This painting, just 24 inches square, fulfills his prescription for dynamic equilibrium, the essence of what he's after, primary colors plus black and white, horizontal and vertical lines. Now, though the lines are wider and they don't just separate the blocks, the lines seem to support them, and yet most of them still don't extend all the way to the edges. So, and when I say support, I realize that there's no actual weight to support. Support is virtual, supporting virtual weight. That sensation of weight is for Mondrian a key element in the game of balance and equilibrium that he's setting out for us. Just observe how it works here. There's a horizontal line or bar near the bottom, running all the way across, almost. It stops just the short of the edges. That suggests that maybe the bar supports everything above it by cantilever. That idea is defeated, though, when you see that the two little legs at the bottom, 
that seem to be supporting it actually stop above the edge. They're floating. There are other frustrations if we're trying to see a logical structure here. Take the red zone on the left. The bars at its top and bottom stop before they get to the edge, and the red keeps right on going out of the picture. How far? Who knows? The same with the yellow at the top. This is destabilizing. We'll see how this ambiguous play with the bars and the edges works in many more pictures. If at first it looks structurally logical, it's not. It reminds us that the painting doesn't represent anything, but it does have other functions. Mondrian has arrived at this painting uh, with other features that become characteristic of him. What looks modular, that, that is heights and widths that are multiples of each other, is actually improvised. It's eyeballed. The light gray square near the middle isn't just prominent, it introduces the suggestion of rotation, that the rectangles on its periphery might cause the whole works to shift clockwise around it unless they were kept stable. I want to show you a painting of a little earlier that Mondrian repainted five years later. It reveals how he was thinking, or as he would say, how he was evolving. Luckily, I can do this because I had time last fall in Basel uh, with the conservator uh, who's made a study of the painting, uh, Friederike Steckling. She took us through her findings on this picture. Among other things, she had reconstructed just how Mondrian painted his black lines without a straight, straight edge, and she helped us see how much experiment and correction he put into getting the width and the opacity of the black lines just right. The spectator with a camera, I should say, is my daughter Anne Walsh, who's an artist and a teacher at Berkeley and was my companion last fall on a kind of Mondrian safari. You'll, you'll see her again. <laughs> you'll see her again in other slides. Um, different kinds of light in the lab reveal things you can't otherwise see. The big one here was what infrared light revealed uh, he, here uh, on the left-hand side of the picture. Uh, what's underneath that red layer, which is a grid drawn in pencil. And when they extended that pattern digitally across the whole design, sure enough, it corresponds to the verticals and horizontals of the painting. So Mondrian began with the grid, drew it, stuck to it most of the time in the painting to determine where his lines would go, just as he'd done with the two checkerboard paintings a few years before. But soon he didn't need to do that. Much of the picture was overpainted in two more phases, and after each, Mondrian signed the picture before it was exhibited. There was quite an accumulation of paint, and um, as the paint cured during those years, and since uh, then, uh, a rich pattern of drying cracks developed, which you can notice uh, in normal light if you try, but in raking light, uh, it shows an especially interesting surface, uh, which mostly disappears again in normal gallery light. The research in Basel uh, turned up even more. Uh, in the microscope, you can see how Mondrian made many changes. In this case, the black lines begin narrower, then he makes them wider, and tinkers some more. In this case, they remained wide. Um, he changed the color of the blocks, too, from in this case, dramatically, uh, the long greenish-blue rectangle at the far right started off red. And you can see that red underneath the damaged spot on the right, lower right. In other places, yellows were originally gray. Reds were orange. The net effect was to replace milder uh, muted colors with primaries which became the classic formula that Mondrian had arrived at by 1925. And what this case demonstrates is not just how finicky Mondrian was, but 
that in those years he was casting off the grid and moving towards greater freedom and clarity. Throughout the 1920s until 1938, Mondrian worked with few interruptions on the works that we know him best for. Various arrangements of colored blocks and black lines, the formula that he firmly believed would best enact the true nature of the world. It would reconcile opposites by bringing them into balance, dynamic, not static. Digital images on a screen, though, are apt to falsify something else. The important fact that Mondrian didn't theorize about, that he made these paintings by hand. He made objects of paint and cloth and wood with the utmost attention, not just to their form, which could as well be captured by a poster, but to the textures of the canvas and the character of the lines and the sheen and the relief of paint structures. You saw his hand at work just now, even in the photos. Here's another um, exam <coughs> demonstration that I can offer you as an advertisement for going to look at the real thing. Uh, the image you saw a moment ago was, is a good digital file, uh, one on the screen now, a good digital file that you can download. And so is this one uh, of a painting in Dallas made by the museum in good, even studio light. Here's another painting of the same year at the Metropolitan, a little smaller, photographed by a visitor, me, in its usual gallery aspect in warmer light, under plexiglass in a shadow box with shadows. I'm going to crop all that out and get closer to it, where I think you can see the paint textures and the slightly lipped up edges of the blue paint as it meets the lines unevenly. And um, in the detail, uh, the shadow of the black line under the blue paint, revealing that he changed his mind. And notice that they use similar uh, devices of composition. Uh, in the Dallas painting, there's a massive block of blue in the upper right. The black lines define or confine the three color blocks, but they let them go at the top and the right off the edge to, again, who knows where. Mondrian achieves balance with that black block way at the far left as a counterweight. And it seems to be gripping a little red block like a hot ingot. <laughs> Does the whole structure rest on the bottom? Well, no. It seems to be suspended with two legs of different lengths that don't reach the edge. It, in fact, again, seems to float. Mondrian tried out vertical uh, formats, too. It took him a few years to settle on pure primaries as well. That is blue, yellow, and red. Before that, he experimented with mixed colors like this, like this orangey red and these various blues. And at the far right, a very rich yellow layered over gray and applied in long vertical strokes that we can easily make out. Mondrian paid a lot of attention to frames. Uh, here in this picture, he's trying out colors for his strip frames. This bluish gray that he applied to the wooden strip, which is set back just a bit, and also to the projecting edges of the canvas, so there's no mistaking where the design ends. Soon he's going to work out a better solution to this. Uh, here, the triad of primary colors is dispersed in long oblong bars in a composition dominated by blocks of various gray. And there's a large square with the bar at the far right, sort of visually thickened uh, by blue. And again, the, the arrangement suggests the possibility of a tilt to the right, or even rotation. But again, there's a counterweight. This time, the red block held aloft 
by a sort of lever arm and the upper left-hand corner. For me, this ha whole composition has something witty about it. The painting at the Museum of Modern Art of the same year is balanced differently, but by forces on either side of a long top-to-bottom bar in the middle. Large, dark, blue shape there on the left, hemmed in by black lines, and at the top, another small red block. The little yellow square at the corner has a kind of odd relation to the black box next to it, seeming to be in the grip of it or being bitten by it. I, I think it was there by Mondrian to provoke a smile, at least. Um, here's another red block held up high. This one has an ambiguous relation to the black bars that seem to support it. It's a tease again. At the top, the red appears to be underneath the black vertical bar, and logically, underneath it for its whole length. At the bottom of the red block, though, the, bar, the, the black bar going sideways looks like a shadow cast by the red block. Space and spatial logic looks like a, it's been eliminated, uh, but Mondrian can always flirt with it and, by extension, invite us to question our expectations. The big empty square is not quite in the center, setting up another imbalance that he corrects. And another thing, the square that looked white is actually a very light gray. The true whites are at the top right and at the left in the middle. Now, so far I've been moving too fast, and I want to propose we slow down for an exercise. I'm going to um, show you two images, and you're going to study them for a couple minutes, and then you'll make a mental note of which of them you prefer, A or B bearing in mind that Mondrian's intention was to create dynamic equilibrium, not static, but stable. So um, here you are, both of them, and then I'm going to show you A. And then B. Again. Now, a simple poll, and you don't, and you don't, you don't have to play. You can, you, you can vote present by <laughs> sitting, on your, <laughs> sitting on your hands. <laughs> but I want to ask you um, two questions. One, which do you prefer? Put up your hand if it's A or B. And second question is, who painted these? <laughs> Put up your, okay, so, okay. Um, and I'm going to, good. Okay, how many votes, uh, how many people prefer A over B? Whoa, okay, and B? Whoa, B wins, but not by a huge margin. How nice. And um, how many of you believe that hmm, both of them are by Mondrian? Whoa, people are very uh, slow, I think. And uh, people who think that they're not by Mondrian, or either isn't by Mondrian. 
Okay, that's good. All right, this is a, there's a tinge of doubt about the <laughs> authenticity here, but I think I think um, B B wins the poll. Um, actually, um, and I don't blame you here. Um, actually, A painted. Uh, Mondrian painted A, and of course what I did is turn it upside down, and I removed the monogram to make B. <laughs> and I've done what Mondrian actually did in the studio uh, from time to time, try out a composition by turning it in several directions on an easel. If you remember B, uh, you may <laughs> have remembered something like it that I showed you before. Uh, hang a second, oops, no. Uh, when I showed you before, this. Um, the picture uh, in to Toledo. Um, but with this, um, Mondrian was trying s something different. Um, if we go back here to A and B together, um, he, what he was doing was loading the top right corner with that black rect rectangle. And opposite uh, the top left corner, and now we're talking about A, in the top left corner, letting the black horizontal bar pull away from the edge and hang there, uh, suggesting that the whole structure could potentially be pulled away to the right. He puts the fiery red patch down where you might associate it with magma or a basement furnace or some such. I could immediately say that Mondrian wanted us not to see images uh, in the real world, but he didn't warn us against our making visual associations. I think that's okay. He would have thought that illegitimate. I want, um, thank you for playing along with me. Um, I want to look um, sideways, uh, as it were, to, at Mondrian's own distinctive format, the diamond, which we saw him inventing before uh, he returned to Paris. He brought some with him on the train, uh, and here you see the studio uh, in Paris um, where my arrows are pointing to two of these unsold compositions hanging high, points down. This format was obviously going to challenge an artist who was looking to create balanced compositions, and that was the point from Mondrian. Um, here, a couple of years later, he uses it with his new trademark primary colors, the grid is gone, and instead we've got mathematically determined, instead of mathematically determined relationships, there are black bars placed intuitively that contain large forms. What's also new is the way the four edges cut diagonally into the composition and create odd polygons. At the right, the blue piece and, and the white in three places around the periphery. He achieves balance with that long horizontal bar above the center, again, placed intuitively. And note that the bar, the, the bar um, all of these bars reach the canvases of the, uh, reach the edge of the canvas, but they're squared off, so they only touch it at one point. So we're not to think uh, that they might be continuing into the space beyond. That is the effect of detaching the design and giving it independence on the canvas. He makes an exception for the blue shape at the far right, the place where a squared off bar would have left a teeny but conspicuous patch of white. The little red triangle at the lower left becomes a familiar player, by the way, in Mondrian's rep company of forms. A couple of years later, comes a bigger diamond painting at the left here with a layout that's basically similar. The black bars are more prominent and now they differ in width. The almost square rectangle at the upper right is the only complete form around which the sliced off colored triangles seem to rotate. The black form at the bottom supplies weight, a kind of ballast that helps stabilize the whole works. And along all four diagonal edges, there's no more play with 
the squared off black bars. They're really neatly cut off so that we might imagine the bars continuing outside as part of some much larger composition we can't see. Another diamond with an even bigger squarish form pushed a little off center and inviting a test of weight on either side. The black triangle on the left versus the pale blue uh, run at the right that's split by a hefty black vertical. Ambitious and inviting you to you speculate about what could lie beyond the diamond frame and whether you could judge it if it would be satisfying. I, I think you couldn't. Here it's interesting to see the relation between a diamond canvas and a rectangular one, like our friend painting A, where the big almost square ex coexists with a, mar a margin all around it that carries the colors. It's stable on its base, despite being detached at top and bottom, and despite the pull that's exerted around it, I've been speaking about these images as though they were posters, again, with no subtleties of paint and texture. I want to show you two details of the right-hand side of the Guggenheim painting that show you just how meticulous he was. At the bottom, um, how that black horizontal strut sits on the red patch, letting red come up halfway up the side. And how at the bottom next to his monogram, after changing and overpainting, he let a little red out at the bottom. Uh, whether there's a distinction with, without a difference here, I don't know, but it shows that he gave question thought. In the detail at the top, you see the adjusted width of the glossy black bar, how he changed it to give it more weight. There were more diamonds in the year to come. We have a drawing that shows Mondrian experimenting with something even more radical, a diamond composition that would be open at the top. Um, here is one of those. I've got to show you two image of, images of it because neither is very good, but you get the idea. Mondrian referred to this picture as, I'm quoting him now, an abstract surrogate of the whole. What he meant isn't exactly clear, but I think he meant a summary or epitome of the whole project as a painter in these works. His next move was to reduce the composition to just two lines and a tiny patch of blue. The horizontal and the vertical, a pair of opposites, which when he brings them into dynamic equilibrium, proclaims the I think, the irreducible, irreducible essence uh, of the world. We feel we're looking at a mystery, this square on a point, these two lines slightly unequal in length and width, and this bit of dark counterweight, blue, representative, representing the primary colors, and maybe not incidentally, the color of sea and sky. When we come together again for the third lecture, uh, we're going to start here and explore how Mondrian achieves dynamic equilibrium in the remaining dozen years of his career. May you all find some equilibrium in your own. <laughs> in the meantime, I'll see you then. <laughs>